This is Church of St. Scenery. <laughs> with all them stamps, what is the plaques and cups and knives and forks? With this Churchill face on them. <laughs> Churchill with his, with his brandy and his cigars and his painting and his rotten painting. <laughs> Hitler, there was a painter for you. Could paint an entire apartment, two coats, one afternoon. <laughs> Churchill. Hitler told funnier jokes than Churchill. He had more hair than Churchill. And he could dance the pants of old Churchill. Knock, knock. Who's that? Winston. Winston who? Ah, you have forgotten about him already, you see. <laughs> Observe, ladies and gentlemen, that the handkerchief, there is nothing in it, yeah? No, look. My head is in the handkerchief. My head has You became, in fact, of course, first of all, before you became an actor, you became a musician, didn't you? You were a, a drummer of some, of some note. Oh, mm -hmm. you remember that, yes. Yes, yes I yes, remember yes. that. What, in fact, um, made you give up music? I mean, why did you decide to jack that in and, and go finally onto stage? Well, it's a very dreary business being a drummer or any musician doing gigs, really, around the country. Right. Because you get a lot of hooray harries who come up to you and ask you for songs, to play songs for them. I mean, a typical musician's story, and this is probably true, it's probably based on fact, is about a um, fellow you know, who came up to a very well-known friend of ours, uh, Alan Clare, mm. pianist. Well, I was pianist, yeah. And said, I say, would you play uh, uh, That's What You Are? So Alan said, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know what, that's what you are. I haven't, I, I'll have a look through the book. So he had a look through the book very quickly. And this chap was sort of dancing around the very tall girl, you know, like that. And, um, take this thing. And he came back and he said, I say, there's a drinky poo in it for you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he came back <laughs> And he said, piano player, piano player. <laughs> And kettle drummer. I was known as a kettle drummer. <laughs> I don't know why. You never used to play a kettle, but it, <laughs> it comes from timpani, you see. He said, aren't you going to play um, that, That's What You Are? So Alan said, I'd love to play That's What You Are, but I don't know how it goes. He said, good God. He said, what is the country coming to? He said, I, I never thought I'd reach the day when somebody didn't know That's What You Are. He said, well, if you sing it, I'll try. He said, it goes like this. Unforgettable. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you can't win if you can't. That's, that's a great musician story. <laughs> it's 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 marvelous, yeah. So you're, you're, you, you learnt um, music from your father, didn't you? A lot of uh, stuff you learnt in the, in the early days. <coughs> Yes, Dad was uh, convinced always I was going to be a road sweeper, you see. He always <laughs> told me, very encouraging with Dad, you see. Yeah. So you turn out to be a bloody road sweeper, will you? I'll tell you that. Is he Yorkshire? Yeah. Ah, lovely. Ah, it's a right, bloody Yorkshire. <laughs> when Dad was... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm <write> bloody Yorkshire. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you why. Um, when, when I first went up to Bingley in Yorkshire, where Dad's people came from, uh, my granddad said he'd heard that my dad had been appearing at the Alhambra. Dad used to be the organist at Bradford Cathedral, you see. A young lad, you see. And to be in that, in a stage business, you know, was all sort of sinful in a way, because there were farmers and whatnot, you know. And he said, I hear our Willie's appearing to tell Alhambra. Someone said, aye. <laughs> he said, uh, I'll have to burn down an arcan unto him. <laughs> <laughs> 
I need subtitles for this one. Yeah. <laughs> and if we arrived on the two o'clock train, he'd like to make sure we got away on the five, which is a good train going at five, huh? aren't <laughs> We were never made very welcome in those yeah. days. Oh. It was very welcome indeed. It was <laughs> yeah. a nice homely place to be. <laughs> can you remember a, a song that, that Dad taught you from, from those days? In fact, I know you can because, in fact, you used a song in a film you did called The Optimist, didn't you? That your dad had, uh, had taught you. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, matter of fact, when Dad taught me to... Um, to get this old burst on the old banjo. The burst on the banjo. Right. When Dad... Um, my dog has fleas on it. Always well, teaching me to play the uh, banjo. Legend had it that he taught George Formby. I don't know whether he ever did actually, but he used to boast about it. Anyway, he probably did actually, because he was quite good on guitar and whatnot. He used to sing a little song. It's sort of very dated now, but it's quite, you know, sweet little thing really. Mm. I've got an idea, soon she'll be Cooking my breakfast, wait and see I haven't told her, she hasn't told me But we know it just the same Saturday night on her city Oh, what a time there's going to be I haven't told her, hasn't told me But we know it just the same She still calls me After I've kissed her, I've got an idea, soon there'll be One little, two little, possibly three I haven't told her, hasn't told me But now <laughs> when you When you sat, you know, about that time, you're talking about uh, a, a, a period when you were uh, appearing um, on stage and also on, on radio. First of all, in those days you used to do impersonations, didn't you? That was what you based your act on. Yeah. 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 What, do, what, what kind of impersonations did you do? I used to do Peter Lorre from the Marty's Fork and you remember? <laughs> <laughs> and I used to Humphrey Bogart and Peter Lorre and Sidney Greenstreet. My God, sir, you are a card. You really are a card. <laughs> Stop twisting my arm, you're hurting my arm. You're hurting me. So a selection of those. <laughs> it's a Tommy Hanley. Well, isn't that nice? What is it? <laughs> it's me lot of leavings. Well, I'll go to the foot of our set. TTFN. What does that mean? It's a tata for now. No, it's the whitey whitey K. What's that? She's you're too young to know. <laughs> Would you like to hear an old actor story? Oh, I'd love to hear an old actor story. I love old actor stories. I, I'm, a, I'm a right sucker for old Me actor. too. Right. This is a story about an old boy who's on tour. He's well past it. And he's on tour up north with a show. And he decides to go into a pub for a drink that morning. And he goes into the pub and he says to the landlord, he said, Good morning, landlord. My name is Warrington Minge. I am appearing in the new play at the Hippodrome, Tomorrow's New Yesterday. And I was wondering if you could oblige me. I'll have a large Remy Martin, please, by cashing this small check. He said, I'm sorry, sir, have you not, have you not seen the notice? He said, what notice are you referring to? No checks cashed for theatrical... Ah, no, he said, I didn't notice that. I must admit, no, no. Make that uh, a lemonade shandy. I'll have a lemonade shandy. I can... Uh, I'll call back for the Remy Martin. So he goes out of the pub, into the butcher shop down the road. He said, good afternoon, Master Butcher. What a fine hygienic establishment you have here. All meat undercover, free from contamination by flies and other pests. <laughs> My name is Warrington Minge. <laughs> I'm appearing at the Theatre Royal in a new play entitled Tomorrow's New Yesterday. And I was wondering whether you could oblige me with a few chops and a liver or something like that. I have this small check I have here by cashing this. He said, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, you see, I'm not the owner here, but uh, the owner was once taken on very badly by a theatric. He said, no, don't bother to go into it. No, no, it's all right, no. If you can prepare a lean chop, I'll call back for it later. He tries about five other shops, ending up at a joint Chinese laundry at the end of the street. Goes into the Chinese laundry, and they come out. <laughs> he said, what a fine race of people, the Chinese. <laughs> Many years I spent in your fine country in repertory in Singapore, I remember, yes. 
My name is Warrington Minge. <laughs> I am appearing in a new play at the Theatre Royal entitled Tomorrow's New Yesterday. And I was wondering whether you could oblige me by cashing this small check. He said, oh, so sorry, Pa. We now I cash check for theatrical. He said, then would you mind pressing the bloody thing? <laughs> I love that Chinese accent. Oh, <laughs> that's no, no. so. Oh, tell me. <laughs> there was a goon show once we did Ah Pong, you remember? Ah Pong, yes. I saw an Ah Pong in Los Angeles. Ah Pong. Where are you, Ah Pong? Yeah, we are Pong till 11 o'clock. <laughs> 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 that was in the street of a thousand dustbins. That was uh, <laughs> in the China story. <laughs> Good luck, Milligan Seacombe. Where are you, folks? Oh, 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 oh. Tell me how you were talking about Milligan Seacombe and, and which leads us naturally onto the goons. How, in fact, did you get your job on, on, on the BBC? I believe you used some subterfuge there, didn't you? Not to say some conning with your, with your voices. <coughs> yes, actually, I was pissed off. Oh, excuse me. Anyway, I was... <laughs> Fed up. Fed up. Right. <laughs> with, uh, I was getting nowhere fast, you know. And I noticed that Roy Spear was doing a show at the time called Ch Showtime, yes. And the compere was Dick Bentley, and there were lots of new acts, you see. And I'd written in, I don't know how many times, to try and get on the show, no reply, the secretary said, to Mr. Spear, blah, 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 blah. But I've got nothing to lose, I thought, well, I'll phone up. So I used to, we were doing these impersonations, and one of the big shows on the air was Much Binding in the Marsh, with Kenneth Horne right. and Dickie Murdoch. Right. And I, I, I just thought I'd do it. You know, you do things at certain times in your life. You've got to get ahead. You've got to get ahead. You know, you've got to... So I thought, if I stay here, I'm dead, you know. Uh, even if he kicks my ass out of there, it doesn't matter, as long as I, I make some impression. Right. So I phoned up, and I thought, being a senior producer, Spear would probably know Horn and Murdoch, you see, who mm. were very big then. And I, I thought, if I click with the secretary, I'll get through, right? So I said, oh, um, hello, um, this is uh, Ken Horn. There's Roy there. Now, once she said, oh, yes, she is uh, Kenneth, I, I knew I was right. So, got on there. Roy said, hello, Ken, how are you? He said, I, I said, listen, uh, Roy, I'm phoning up because I know that new show you've got on, um, what is it, uh, Showtime or something. Dickie and I were at a cabaret the other night, saw an amazing young fellow called Peter, Peter what was his name? He said Peter Sellers. Uh, Sellers, Sellers, uh, Sellers. Uh, anyway, I think it would be very good if you had, probably had him in the show, you know, or something like that. Just a little tip, little tip. We just go around looking, you know. He said, well, it's very nice of you, you know. And then it came to the crunch, and I said, ah, uh, I, uh, it, it's me. He said, what? I said, it's me, Peter Sellers talking, and it's the only way I could get to you. And would you give me a date on your show? And he said, you cheeky young sod, he said. <laughs> he said, what do you do? I said, well, obviously do impersonations. <laughs> 22 at the time. And anyway, I went up there and I got a date on the spot and I got into, I got a good writer, first writer I've ever had in my life, mm. you know. It's really nice. Was, fil was getting into films as easy as that, Peter, or...? or no, no, films was, uh, films were a, a sort of um, closed shop. I, I really wanted to, you see, I've been a great film fan all my life. Mm. I wanted to get so much in. I mean, I, I know I'm a real movie buff. I can, I, you know, I can really talk about all the old movies and everything, and the new ones as well. Yeah. And I wanted to be a movie actor. Well, let's, let's, let's have a look at something from the <clears throat> very start of your film career. The, the film that, that sort of you know started you basically on your on your film career but the thing of course that was happening to you <coughs> before then of course it was probably one of the most significant things I know to you in your career and that was the goons uh -huh. which I know that I mean wasn't just a passing phase in your career it's something that you still very much adore in fact you look back on it with tremendous fondness and things like the that. The happiest time in my life yes actually, professionally in my life yes yeah. and of course you brought out this uh, this book which is the the book of the goons which in fact is the third uh, yeah this is the third one this is the final one I expect yes yeah. yes, yes and yes. there's there's one marvelous thing in here which was I was going to ask you about um, mm. the goon voices and where they came from and this sort of thing 
And in fact, in the book itself, we've got this marvellous little section, which I can find here, I think, which in fact is a, a sort of glossary, it's called, which lists all the voices and, um, oh, yeah. and tells you, defines them. It was quite right. could, could you in fact go through the ones that, that you yourself were involved with? Well, I'll have to tell you about them all, but I'll give, give sure. it very quickly. Jim Spriggs, a kind of strangulated voice that Spike used, pronounced Jim. He was a hello Jim, hello Jim. What it was, Spike used to s sort of pronounce these words in the, ma C, uh, in the key of C major. Hello Jim, hello Jim, hello hello. Hello Jim, hello hello. Little Jim. <laughs> A high-pitched child played by Spike who lives in Eccles' boot <laughs> is thought to be his nephew. He points out when people, he used to say, He's falling in the water. <laughs> when Spike and uh, Eccles and Blue Bottle used to have a scene, they get that, What did he say, little Jim? Spike. And he said, He's falling in the water. <laughs> A Swede, Swede, a very rustic voice based on a character who Peter met in Sussex, the home of producer Peter Eaton. Now I remember that. <laughs> Peter Eaton said he was talking in a field with one of these fellows, and he turned voice more And a whacking great Boeing went across and drowned out everything they said, you see. <laughs> And after it had gone away and all sound had gone, this fellow says, I don't like all that bloody tackle up there. <laughs> now he'd reduced years of research and everything <laughs> into one word. <laughs> oh, I, oh, I don't like that tackle, no. <laughs> <laughs> Geraldo, well, we all remember dear old Geraldo. Yeah. That was a sort of voice. He'd say, hello again, we're on the radio again. Based on the late Bandley's voice, yes. Flower Dew, a camp voice used by Peter and Spike. This is based on a couple of poofs we knew at the time. <laughs> I'm sorry, big pardon, I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, you know, so. Called Flower and Dew. Right? Flower and Dew. Mm -hmm. uh, who uh, had gone to church for the first, uh, one had gone to church for the first time. I said, you must come to church. I said, oh, I can't. Oh, so, yes, I must, you know. <laughs> and we come to the full ceremony, you know. So we go in there, he said, well, I don't know what to do. He said, don't worry about it, you know. He said, I know the whole thing, you know. Instead, when the priest came in uh, with a, you know, incense and he was waving around all the smoke was coming out, he said, oh, I'm going to find And they're walking down the aisle, the priest was walking down the aisle with the choir boys, and this other one, who didn't know much about it, rushed up to the priest, grabbed his arm, and he said, I say, do you realize your handbag's on fire? <laughs> Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> I should be banned from everything soon. <laughs> banned from the East Finchley Boy Scouts Club. <laughs> Terrible. Singe's lalkaka. Singe's thing. Singe's thing. That's what I like. Singe's thing. <laughs> oh! <laughs> and how <I'm vanity. laughs> Two Hindus played by Peter and Spike. Well, now, Spike was born in India, as you know, and I spent about three years out there, so we started to bring this sound back. Now, a lot of people came back from India at that time and suddenly and knew the sound very well, but couldn't, you know, they hadn't heard anybody. No, no, please, so that was that. <laughs> How can that? Well, that, they became incredibly popular, those two. Fred Bogg, it said, a cockney idiot played by Harry. Now, I can't remember how he did this. He used to have he used to quite a few voices. I can't remember. I can't remember the Fred, Fred Bogg voice. I can't remember that one. Cyril, a friend of Spike and Peter. Cyril Waterman was a chap who used to live in these flats, you know. And Cyril was the sort of fellow who had to do something before you had done it. Now, if we'd been to the Palladium to see a top of the bill, and we saw, say, he said, we saw Sid Nurge last week, Cyril. He said, I've seen him, I've seen him, I've seen him. <laughs> so I said, he's only open last night. He said, oh, no, I've seen him, I've seen him. <laughs> He went to the south of France, I tell you, tell everything, he went to the south of France and he said, who do you think I saw in the south of France? So I said, I don't know, he said, Don Andrews, Don Andrews! 
And then he said, he's a confirmed alcoholic. Confirmed alcoholic. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure he never met down to how, I mean, I don't know how he knew, can, I mean, probably down there he's never had a drink in his life. I'm sure, I'm sure not. That was in thing to know about, yeah. you see. Cyril, Athenium, Athenium. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I wonder if he's listening to that. It's funny. L listening, what am I talking It's radio, it's television. Uh, Hearn, salesman. Ernest Hearn, a solemn, humorless American announcer, voice used by me. Yes, I used to do that. I used to say, well, uh, on the harp at the horn, the horn. We used to use the sounds, American sounds. We didn't use words. This is the American bar of the horn, bar of the lame song, the horn. Now the horn, bar of the horn, the horn. African chief used or based on big chief Ellinger Ellington. Bim bum bala boo. He was always chasing blood knock for, you know, very sort of naughty reasons, you know. He said, don't come in, don't come in, Ellinger. Don't come in. If me one come in, make you prisoner, blood knock. Oh, oh, oh. Come inside, come inside. Me come in. And then as soon as he got in, blood knock would rush out the door and nail it up. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, a quavering duchessy voice used by Peter. Oh, I used to use a duchessy voice. I've always done that one. Oh, my dad, dad. <laughs> Oh, I know, dirty stuff, I can't tell. But, um, <laughs> oh, it was so terribly like that. When they all live in Eaton Square or Belgrave Square. And they were so frightfully like that. Oh, terribly. Let's do a lot of it. When you work with somebody like Spike on, on a film or whatever, you've got a reputation of being a, a hell of a giggler, haven't you? I mean, you, you corpse on set and this sort of thing. Did you have that problem with, with Spike at all? <coughs> Uh, yes, but we usually laugh before it happens, somehow or other. Other times, you know, um, I don't know, it's when the laughter gets over you or takes you over. Yes. Yeah. Well, who are the other great gigglers, Peter, that, that, that you know about? Well, there's a lot of them in the business. O'Toole, uh, you know, Peter O'Toole is a, a notorious giggler. He, um, he, oh, yes, he taught, he, he, <laughs> uh, when he was making Lawrence of Arabia, do you ever remember the scene in Lawrence of Arabia where King Faisal, played by Alec Guinness, welcomed Peter O'Toole and Anthony Quayle into his tent to listen to a passage read from the Quran? They'd ridden through the desert. Now, O'Toole uh, usually likes to have, or used to like to have anyway, you know, a bit of the old shampoo in the morning <laughs> and to sort of warm up. And Anthony Quayle, is pretty straight-faced. Actually, he was once described, ob obviously very wrongly, by um, uh, John Gielgud as having a face like two tins of condemned veal. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is a rather cruel way, but I mean, you know what I mean? It's a sort of uh, uh, image. And <laughs> he, uh, he never broke up, you see, but O'Toole was breaking up con uh, continuously. And the problem was this. As they came into the tent, Guinness would say, and David Lean's a stickler you, for reality, you know. And they were filming in the middle of the desert. Now, believe it or not, Sam Spiegel, who is Jewish, 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 had managed to con King Hussein of Jordan into allowing an actor, an English actor, to quote from the Koran. Now, to do this, I mean, this is an enormous con. I mean, it's an enormous uh, coup to do, to get this, you know, to enable this to happen. And, but providing there was a priest there who knew English and could tell if the Quran was misquoted, which it was never been, uh, it, everything was okay. Now the scene was that um, Peter came into the tent with Anthony Quayle and they sat down and Peter was having this terrible bout of giggles because a dear old actor, God rest his soul, who's passed by now, Henry Oscar, was playing Selim. This is a story told by Peter O'Toole to me. Um, was for, couldn't remember the Quran, you see. I mean, there's masses of it. And he was quoting a section called The Brightness. And Alex said, Ah, oh, welcome, Orans, Orans, Orans. Welcome to my tent. <laughs> Sit down. We're just in time to hear Selim quote from The Brightness. Selim, give us the brightness. <laughs> now, this had happened several times. And Henry Oscar couldn't remember the brightness, you see. He'd get a few words into it. But being a pro, he'd carry on. Even if he dried up, he'd keep it going. That was the main thing. That wasn't good enough for the, for, for the priest, you see. And uh, there would be something said round the back and they cut, you see. And O'Toole would get into a terrible state. And um, eventually, after 15 takes, um, 
Guinness, Guinness, who'd been absolutely straight all this way, Alec Guinness said, Gentlemen, gentlemen, we are all professionals, for God's sake. Let us remember we are professionals. So uh, David Lean said, look, look, let's all cut for about 10 minutes. Let's go out, have a smoke, walk around the tent. They were in the middle of the desert with lights inside the tent, on top of the heat already. You can imagine what it was like. Henry Oscar's beard that was stuck on with spirit gum was coming off in the edges. And all. And he was getting very nervous by this time, you see. So they start to walk around the tent outside. And O'Toole's saying to himself, like we all do when these things happen, you know, I must not laugh, I will not laugh, I cannot laugh. It's the end of my career. If I laugh again, I'm dead. I must not laugh, I will not laugh, I cannot laugh. <laughs> Alec Guinness has another la uh, walk. You know, Alec Guinness walks like that. <laughs> He says, I hope they don't laugh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> so they all get inside again, you see. And but this time they've t tatted up old uh, <laughs> Henry Oscar's beard with a bit more spirit gum. They've written a bit of Koran on each fingernail. <laughs> everywhere he looks is a bit of Koran, so he can't go wrong. On the table, up this fella's nose, everywhere. He goes. <laughs> so, David Lean says, okay, let's have another go. Now, Tool said, I, am, I must not laugh, I will not laugh, you see. And he's all set. In comes with the condemned deal. He comes in the thing. And uh, no disrespect to Anthony Crowell at all, please. Uh, he comes in the room, and uh, Guinness says, right, says, David Lean says, action. In comes O'Toole and Guinness says, Welcome, Orans, welcome, welcome, welcome. We were just listening to Salim quoting from the Quran from a selection called The Brightness. Please sit down with Captain so and so and listen. And now, and he turned around to Henry Oscar, who was all glued up and everything, and he said, And now, Salim, give us the. <laughs> Very <laughs> complete. Let's let's have a look at you now in uh, in some in a similar situation, blowing certain sequences. I take uh, from in fact two films that you made with another ace giggler called Blake Edwards. The first is oh. shot in the dark, the other is Return of the Pink Panther. Don't be ridiculous. No. Oh. <laughs> look at that. Um, okay. <laughs> I just like. <laughs> <laughs> and I submit, Monsieur Ballon, that you arrived home, found Maria Gambrelli with Miguel Astos, and filled him in a writ of Fellas J. <laughs> <laughs> Museum, yeah, yeah. It's better. Yes. <laughs> better. Another coup. <laughs> better. <laughs> so. <laughs> I have fixed your doorbell from the ring. <laughs> uh, because I am an expert and troubleshooter, I just <laughs> might be... You require anything. Monsieur, all I require is a little privacy in which to work, my bag of tools. And... <laughs> It is my business to know. <coughs> he is Sir Charles Phantom, the notorious... No. <laughs> Sir 
They are funny, aren't they? It's amazing, actually, when you watch them. I mean, Blake Edwards has got about 200,000 feet of you doing that. And it's, it's amazing you ever finish a film with him. We always have two weeks extra for laughs, you know. For giggling? Yeah. You've had a, a fairly sort of turbulent and mixed up uh, private life, haven't you, throughout, throughout your career? Are you kind of happier now than you've been at, uh, at other points in your career? Yes, I'm very happy now. I, I, uh, as you know, I, I've been married three times, hmm. and um, on three occasions it really didn't work, uh, mainly probably due to the fact that I'm impossible to live with, although my first marriage was, I mean, that was entirely my fault, that broke up. Where was it? Oh, I just had a romance with somebody I was working with, <laughs> and... Um, you care to say who? Oh, well... Boom, diddy, boom, diddy, boom, diddy, boom. <laughs> but anyway, I was terribly happily married. That was the thing. And I, um, anyway. Second time, of course, with uh, Miss Impact. It's, uh, <laughs> Miss Impact? Yeah, that's what I read in the paper, anyway. <laughs> no. Miss Eckland? Miss Eckland, yes. Mm. yes. Now, that didn't work because of, I don't know why it didn't really work, but anyway, good luck, because she's a good try, Brit, and, um, and I think that was just a uh, mismatch completely. Third time with Miranda, that didn't work, that was just wrong for some reason. Probably me again, I don't know what. But I think that somewhere there's somebody for everybody. And I'm very, very happy at this very moment. Very, very happy indeed. Are you going to find <coughs> the kind of fulfillment you're looking for, though, in, in your work or in a relationship with a woman, do you think? I don't think I ever find it in a relationship with a woman. Because the only time that you're really happy is at the time that you're doing it. Not when the film comes out, when you're preparing for the film, but at the moment you're doing the take on the floor. And when you do it, and that moment comes out of you, and you've done it, and you remember that, that's why Blake keeps his outtakes, you see. That's the time when the, the achievement, the full feeling of achievement comes out. Even when you see the rushes the next day and you think, oh, no. But Nevertheless, the memory of what you did at, at the previous day. Living for, for the moment of creation rather than seeing it captured on the, on the, on yes. the analog. I wonder how you would have found this kind of fulfillment that you just talked about professionally. Had you been of another era when films weren't invented, in fact? I mean, what might you have been then? Would you have been a, the comic actor? Would you have been the classical actor? Would you have been the vaudevillian or, or what? I'd have probably ended up as a road sweeper, <laughs> doing impressions of George Formby or something. <laughs> In fact, tonight what I want you to do to close, if you would please, is to do your little bit of uh, George Formby. No, is, is that right? Well, turned out nice again, didn't it? Aye, you know, <laughs> something like that. That'd be nice. That's, that's going back a bit, isn't it? Yeah. Do you admire him particularly? Yeah, I think he was a terrific performer. Used to make masses of movies, you remember? Oh yeah, one a day. One a day. <laughs> Marvelous. But they were great, weren't they? Ah, they were They're great movies, yeah, you know. Great, yeah. And um, Bombay. Uh, those days we didn't have the critics who said, "I don't know that there was something sort of lacking in the sort of cosmic quality about Formby's playing." I mean, there weren't those critics around in those no, days. People true. used to say, "Bloody awful," or "All right," you know. Uh, <laughs> let's have a reminder of it. Let's have the old, the old Formby. Let me give you yeah. your your uke. In you, what yeah. you gonna do? Well, um, I think. I take longer to tune up than Ravi Shankar, I might tell you. <laughs> what about when I'm cleaning windows? Why not? Hmm? And why not? And why not? Why not? Why not? In the manner of George Ford. <laughs> Turned out nice again, didn't it? <laughs> One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> For a nosy parker, it's an interesting job. Now it's a job that just suits me. A window cleaner you would be if you could see what I can see when I'm cleaning windows. Honeymooning couples too. You should see the bill and coo. You'd be surprised the things they do when I'm cleaning windows. In my profession, I work hard, but I'll never stop. Climb this blinking ladder till I get right to the top. Now 
the bush in bright, she looks divine. The bridegroom, he is doing fine. I'd rather have his job than mine. When I'm cleaning windows, chambermaid, sweet names I call. It's a wonder I don't fall. My mind's not on me work at all. When I'm cleaning windows, I know a fella such a swell. He has a thirst that's plain to tell. I've seen him drink his bath as well. When I'm cleaning windows, in my profession I work hard. But I'll never stop. <laughs> I'll climb this blinking ladder till I get right to the top. Pajamas laying side by side. Ladies' night is I have spied. I've often seen what goes inside. When I'm cleaning windows, Sir, have you, not, have you not seen the notice? He said, what notice are you referring to? No checks cashed for theatrical... Ah, no, he said, I didn't notice that. I must admit, no, no. Make that uh, a lemonade shandy. I'll have a lemonade shandy. I can... Uh, I'll call back for the Remy Martin. So he goes out of the pub into the butcher shop down the road. He said, good afternoon, Master Butcher. What a fine hygienic establishment you have here. All meat undercover, free from contamination by flies and other pests. <laughs> My name is Warrington Minge. <laughs> I'm appearing at the Theatre Royal in a new play entitled Tomorrow's New Yesterday, and I was wondering whether you could oblige me with a few chops and old liver or something like that. I, this small check I have here by cashing this... He said, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, you see, I'm not the owner here, but uh, the owner was once taken on very badly by a theatric. He said, no, don't bother to go into it. No, no, it's all right, no. If you can prepare a lean chop, I'll call back for it later. He tries about five other shops, ending up at a joint Chinese laundry at the end of the street. Goes into the Chinese laundry, and they come out. <laughs> he said, what a fine race of people, the Chinese. <laughs> Many years I spent in your fine country in repertory in Singapore, I remember, yes. My name is Warrington Minge. <laughs> I am appearing in a new play at the Theatre Royal entitled Tomorrow's New Yesterday. And I was wondering whether you could oblige me by... ...cashing this small check. He said, oh, so sorry, sir. We now I cash check for theatricals. <laughs> he said, then would you mind pressing the bloody thing? <laughs> oh, I love that Chinese accent. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so... Oh. Tell me, there was a goon show once we did, Ah Pong, you remember? Ah Pong, yeah. I saw an Ah Pong in Los Angeles, Ah Pong, where are you Ah Pong? Yeah, we Ah Pong till 11 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> that was in the street of a thousand dustbins, that was uh, in the China story. Good luck, Milligan Seacombe, where are you, folks? <laughs> Tell me how you were talking about Milligan Seacombe, and, and which leads us naturally onto the goons. How, in fact, did you get your job on, on, on the BBC? I believe you used some subterfuge there, didn't you? Not to say some conning with your, with your voices. <laughs> yes, actually, I was pissed off. Oh, excuse me. Anyway, I was <laughs> fed up. Fed up. Right. <laughs> with, uh, I was getting nowhere fast, you know. And I noticed that Roy Spear was doing a show at the time called Sh Showtime, yes. And the compere was Dick Bentley, and there were lots of new acts, you see. And I'd written in, I don't know how many times, to try and get on the show. No Young to know. <laughs> Would you like to hear an old actor story? Oh, I'd love to hear an old actor story. I love old actor stories. I, I'm, a, I'm a right sucker for old Me actors. Me too. Right. This is a story about an old boy who's on tour. He's well past it. And he's on tour up north with a show. And he decides to go into a pub for a drink that morning. 
And he goes into the pub and he says to the landlord, he said, good morning, landlord. My name is Warrington Minge. I am appearing in the new play at the Hippodrome, Tomorrow's New Yesterday. And I was wondering if you could oblige me, I'll have a large Remy Martin, please, by cashing this small check. He said, I'm sorry, sir, have you not, have you not seen the notice? He said, what notice are you referring to? No checks cashed for theatrical... Ah, no, he said, I didn't notice that. I must admit, no, no. Make that uh, a lemonade shandy. I'll have a lemonade shandy. I can... Uh, I'll call back for the Remy Martin. So he goes out of the pub, into the butcher shop down the road. He said, good afternoon, Master Butcher. What a fine hygienic establishment you have here. All meat undercover, free from contamination by flies and other pests. <laughs> My name is Warrington Minge. <laughs> I am appearing at the Theatre Royal in a new play entitled Tomorrow's New Yesterday, and I was wondering whether you could oblige me with a few chops and a liver or something like that. I, this small check I have here, by cashing this... He said, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, you see, I'm not the owner here, but uh, the owner was once taken on very badly by a theatre. He said, no, don't bother to go into it. No, no, it's all right, no. If you can prepare a lean chop, I'll call back for it later. He tries about five other shops, ending up at a joint Chinese laundry at the end of the street. Because it's the Chinese laundry. And they come out. She said, what a fine race of people, the Chinese. <laughs> Many years I spent in your fine country in repertory in Singapore, I remember, yes. My name is Warrington Minge. <laughs> I am appearing in a new play at the Theatre Royal entitled Tomorrow's New Yesterday. And I was wondering whether you could oblige me by... Cashing this small check. He said, oh, so sorry, sir. We now I cash check for theatrical. <laughs> he said, then would you mind pressing the bloody thing? <laughs> I love that Chinese accent. Oh, <laughs> no, no, no. So, oh. Tell me, there was a goon show once we did, Ah Pong, you remember? Ah Pong, yeah. I saw an Ah Pong in Los Angeles, Ah Pong. Where are you, Ah Pong? Yeah, we Ah Pong till 11 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> that was in the street of a thousand dustbins. That was a... <laughs> in the sweeper, will you? I'll tell you that. Is he auction? Yeah. Oh, ah, lovely. Ah, it's a right, bloody auction. <laughs> when Dad was... Uh, <laughs> Bloody auction! <laughs> well, I'll tell you why. Um, when, when I first went up to Bingley in Yorkshire, where Dad's people came from, uh, my granddad said he'd heard that my dad had been appearing at the Alhambra. Dad used to be the organist at Bradford Cathedral, you see. A young lad, you see. And to be in that in a stage business, you know, was all sort of sinful in a way, because they were farmers and whatnot, you know. And he said, I hear our Willie's appearing to tell Umbra. Someone said, aye. <laughs> he said, uh, I'll have to burn down an Arcanon to him. <laughs> we need subtitles for this one. Yeah. <laughs> and if we arrived on the two o'clock train, he'd like to make sure we got away on the five. He says, a good train going at five, huh? <laughs> We were never made very welcome in those yeah. days. Huh? It was very welcome indeed. It was <laughs> yeah. a nice homely place yeah. to be. Can you remember a, a song that, that Dad taught you from, from those days? In fact, I know you can, because in fact you used a song in a film you did called The Optimist, didn't you? That your dad had, uh, had taught you. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, matter of fact, when Dad taught me to... Um, the the old first on the old banjo. The first on the banjo. Right. When Dad... Um, my dog has fleas on it. Always teaching me to play the uh, banjo. Legend had it that he taught George Formby. I don't know whether he ever did actually, but he used to boast about it. Anyway, he probably did actually, because he was quite good on guitar and whatnot. He used to sing a little song. It's sort of very dated now, but it's quite, you know, sweet little thing really. Mm. I've got an idea, soon she'll be cooking my breakfast, wait and see, I haven't told her, she hasn't told me, but we know it just the same. Saturday night on her city, oh what a time there's going to be, I haven't told her, hasn't told me, but we know it just the same. 
When you sat you know, about that time, you're talking about uh, a, a, a period when you were uh, appearing um, on stage and also on, on radio. First of all, in those days, yeah. it said when the priest came in uh, with a you know incense and he was waving around, all the smoke was coming out. He said, oh, all about the good fun, what a fun, what a And they're walking down the aisle. The priest was walking down the aisle with the choir boys, and. This other one, who didn't know much about it, rushed up to the priest, grabbed his arm, and he said, I say, do you realize your handbag's on fire? Ah, <laughs> 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 oh, yes. <laughs> I should be banned from everything soon. <laughs> <laughs> Man from the East Finchley Boy Scouts Club. <laughs> Terrible. Singe's lalkaka. Singe's thing. Singe's thing. That's what I like. Singe's thing. <laughs> oh! <laughs> and how is that <laughs> Two Hindus played by Peter and Spike. <clears throat> well, now, Spike was born in India, as you know, and I spent about three years out there, so we started to bring this sound back. Now, a lot of people came back from India at that time and suddenly uh, knew the sound very well, but couldn't, you know, they, they hadn't heard anybody. They were there wanting, what I want to know, sir. No, no, please, but it turned out. So that was that. <laughs> <laughs> that be that was that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, they became incredibly popular, those two. Fred Bogg, it said, a cockney idiot played by Harry. <laughs> now, I can't remember how he doing this. He used to, Harry used to do quite a few voices. I can't remember, I can't remember the Pre Fred Bogg voice. I can't remember that one. Cyril, a friend of Spike and Peter. Cyril Waterman was a chap who used to live in these flats, you know. And Cyril was the sort of fellow who had to do something before you had done it. Now, if we'd been to the Palladium to see a top of the bill, and we saw, say, he said, we saw Sid Nurge last week, Cyril. He said, I've seen him, I've seen him, I've seen him. <laughs> so I said, he's only open last night. He said, oh, no, I've seen him, I've seen him. <laughs> He went to the south of France, I tell you a terrible thing, he went to the south of France and he said, who do you think I saw in the south of France? So I said, I don't know, he said, Don Andrews, Don Andrews! <laughs> and then he said, he's a confirmed alcoholic, confirmed alcoholic! <laughs> I mean, I'm sure you never met Don Andrews, I mean, I don't know how he knew, I mean, probably Don Andrews never had a drink in his life. Oh, sure, I'm sure not. That was in thing to know about yeah. this, Cyril. <laughs> I've seen him, I've seen him. Um, <laughs> I wonder if he's listening tonight. It's really funny. L listening. What am I talking? It's radio. It's television. Uh, Hearn salesman. Ernest Hearn, a solemn, humorous American announcer. Voice used by me. Yes, I used to do that. I used to say, "Well, I'm on the harp the horn." We used to use the sounds, American sounds. We didn't use words. This is the American bar of the horn part. Well, I'm horn the horn. Now I'm horn part of the horn. They've written a bit of Koran on each fingernail. <laughs> Everywhere he looks is a bit of Koran, so he can't go wrong. On the table, up this fella's nose, everywhere. <laughs> so, David Lean says, OK, let's have another go. Now, Tool said, I, am, I must not laugh. I will not laugh, you see. And he's all set. In comes with the condemned deal. He comes in the... the and uh, no disrespect to Anthony Crowell at all, please. Uh, he comes in the room. And uh, Guinness says, right, says, David Lean says, action. In comes O'Toole and Guinness says, welcome, Orans, welcome, welcome, welcome. We were just listening to Salim quoting from the Quran from a selection called The Brightness. Please sit down with Captain so and so and listen. And now, and he turned around to Henry Oscar, who was all glued up and everything. <laughs> and he said, and now, Salim, give us the... <laughs> <laughs> he totally blew it. Blew it. <laughs> blew it completely. Let's 
Let's have a look at you now in uh, in some in a similar situation, blowing certain sequences. I've taken uh, from, in fact, two films that you made with another ace giggler called Blake Edwards. The first is oh. shot in the dark, the other is Return of the Pink Panther. Don't be ridiculous. Oh. Of course, up here again, I'm sorry. Look at him. I just like. <laughs> then I submit, Monsieur Ballon, that you arrived home, found Maria Gambrelli with Miguel Astos, and filled him in a writ of fellas jade. Inspector. The interesting museum here. Yeah. Inspector. Yes. <laughs> Better. Another coup. <laughs> Better. <laughs> so. <laughs> I have fixed your doorbell from the ring. <laughs> uh, because I am an expert and troubleshooter, I just not... <laughs> yeah. Cashing this small check. Is it all so sorry, sir? We now I cash check for theatrical. <laughs> he said, then would you mind pressing the bloody thing? <laughs> I love that Chinese accent. Ah, <laughs> that's that's so, oh, tell me, there was a goon show once we did, Ah Pong, you remember? Ah Pong, yes. I saw an Ah Pong in Los Angeles, Ah Pong. Where are you, Ah Pong? Yeah, we Ah Pong till 11 o'clock. <laughs> 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 that was in the street of a thousand dustbins. That was a, <laughs> in the China story. <laughs> Good luck, Milligan Seacombe. Where are you, folks? <laughs> oh, I, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Tell me how you, talking about Milligan Seacombe and, and which leads us naturally onto the goons, how in fact did you get your job on, on, on the BBC? I believe you used some subterfuge there, didn't you? Not to say some conning with your, with your voices. <coughs> yes, actually, I was pissed off. Oh, excuse me. Anyway, I was... <laughs> Fed up. Fed up. Right. <laughs> with, uh, I was getting nowhere fast, you know. And I noticed that Roy Spear was doing a show at the time called Ch Showtime, yes. And the compare was Dick Bentley, and there were lots of new acts, you see. And I'd written in, I don't know how many times, to try and get on the show, no reply. The secretary said, for Mr. Spear, blah, 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 blah. But I've got nothing to lose. I thought, well, I'll phone up. So I used to, we were doing these impersonations, and one of the big shows on the air was Much Binding in the Marsh, with Kenneth Horne right. and Dickie Murdoch. Right. And I, I, I just thought I'd do it. You know, you do things at certain times in your life. You've got to get ahead. You've got to get ahead, you know. You've got to... So I thought, if I stay here, I'm dead, you know. Uh, even if he kicks my ass out of there, it doesn't matter, as long as I, I make some impression. Right. So I phoned up, and I thought, being a senior producer, Spear would probably know Horn and Murdoch, you see, who mm. were very big then. And I, I thought, if I click with the secretary, I'll get through, right? So I said, oh, um, hello, um, this is uh, Ken Horn. There's Roy there. Now, once she said, oh, yes, she is uh, Kenneth, I, I knew I was right. So, so, got on there, Roy said, hello, Ken, how are you? He said, I, I said, listen, uh, Roy, I'm phoning up because I know that new show you've got on, um, what is it, uh, Showtime or something. Dickie and I were at a cabaret the other night, saw an amazing young fellow called Peter, Peter what was his name? He said Peter Sellers. Uh, uh, Peter Sellers, Sellers, uh, Sellers. Uh, anyway, uh, I think it'd be very good if you had, probably had him in the show, you know, or something like that. Just a little tip, little tip, we just go around looking, you know. He said, well, it's very nice of you, you know. And then it came to the crunch, and I said, ah, uh, I, uh, it, it's me. He said, what? I said, it's me, Peter Sellers talking, and it's the only way I could get to you. And would you give me a date on your show? And he said, you cheeky young sod. Winston who? Ah, you have forgotten about him already, you see. <laughs> <laughs> Can't 
only observe, ladies and gentlemen, that the handkerchief, there is nothing in it, yeah? Now look. My head is in the handkerchief. My head has gone! You became, in fact, of course, first of all, before you became an actor, you became a musician, didn't you? You were a, a drummer. Of some of some note. Oh, you remember that? Yes, yes, yes I remember yes. that. What, in fact, um, made you give up music? I mean, why did you decide to jack that in and, and go finally onto stage? Well, it's a very dreary business being a drummer or any musician doing gigs really around the country, right. because you get a lot of hooray Harrys who come up to you and ask you for songs to play songs for them. I mean, a typical musician's story, and this is probably true, it's probably based on fact, is about a um, fellow who came up to a very well-known friend of ours, uh, Alan Clare, mm. pianist. Marvelous pianist, yeah. And said, I say, would you play uh, uh, That's What You Are? So Alan said, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know what That's What You Are. I haven't, I, I'll have a look through the book. So he had a look through the book quickly. And this chap was sort of dancing around the very tall girl, you know, like that. And, um, and he came back and he said, I say, there's a drinky poo in it for you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and he came back <laughs> and he said, piano player, piano player, <laughs> and kettle drummer. I was known as a kettle drummer. <laughs> I don't know why. You never used to play a kettle, but it, <laughs> it comes from timpani, you see. He said, aren't you going to play um, that... And that's what you are. So Alan said, I'd love to play That's What You Are, but I don't know how it goes. He said, good God. He said, what is the country coming to? He said, I, I know I thought I'd reach the day when somebody didn't know That's What You Are. He said, well, if you sing it, I'll try. He said, it goes like this. Unforgettable. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Alec Guinness has another uh, walk. You know, Alec Guinness walks like that. <laughs> He says, I hope they don't laugh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <what? laughs> so they all get inside again, you see. And, but this time they've t tatted up old uh, <laughs> Henry Oscar's beer with a bit more spirit gum. They've written a bit of Koran on each fingernail. <laughs> everywhere he looks is a bit of Koran, so he can't go wrong. On the table, up this fella's nose, everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so, David Lean says, Okay, let's have another go. Now, Tool said, I, am, I must not laugh. I will not laugh, you see. And he's all set. In comes with the condemned deal. He comes in the... Thing. And uh, no disrespect to Anthony Crowell at all, please. Uh, he comes in the room. And uh, Guinness says, right, says, David Lean says, Action! In comes O'Toole and Guinness says, Welcome, Orans, welcome, welcome, welcome. We were just listening to Salim quoting from the Quran from a selection called The Brightness. Please sit down with Captain So-and-so and listen. And now, and he turned around to Henry Oscar, who was all glued up and everything, and he said, And now, Salim, give us the... <laughs> Very <laughs> complete. Let's let's have a look at you now in uh, in some in a similar situation, blowing certain sequences. We're taking from in fact two films that you made with another ace giggler called Blake Edwards. The first is oh. shot in the dark, the other is Return of the Pink Panther. Don't be ridiculous. No. Look at him. I just like. <laughs> <laughs> and I submit, Monsieur Ballon, that you arrived home, found Maria Gambrelli with Miguel Astos, and filled him in a writ of Fellas Jade. It's 
Inspector? Uh, yes, Inspector. The interesting museum you have here. Inspector. Yes. <laughs> Better. Another. <laughs> Where